And we are live. Hey there, it's Dr. J. Time for a nice live Q&A. So anyone that has any questions, feel free and pop them up in the sidebar on the chat and we can go to town here. So really excited to be here. Great little Friday here in Austin, Texas. You can see good weather out here behind me. So again, whatever health topic you guys want to chat about, feel free and bring it up in the comments section and we will go to town. So off the bat, I've been doing a couple of videos here recently this last week or so on fasting, on intermittent fasting. Now, I think there's some really good benefits from it. Now, a good way to kind of ease your way into intermittent fasting, a couple of little tips and tricks, is a modified protein fast. So if you're kind of like concerned, maybe you, you want to get some of those benefits, but you don't want to skip a meal, well, a great thing you can do is just really load up on fat in the morning time. So like coffee, butter, MCT oil, very low in protein, right? Probably 70, probably 80% fat. So you can at least get some very good fats in your body. It'll be stabilizing for your body. You'll feel good. You'll feel satiated. Remember, fat's got one of the best feedback loops to your brain that tells you you're full. So if you don't want to be hungry, there's some great op op options there. You're still avoiding the protein, so you still get that cellular autophagy that's happening where you're recycling those proteins. You get that really good um, anti-aging benefits from that, which is great, but you're not going to be hungry. So that's a great starting point. And then the next thing you could do to add a little bit more in there is you could add in some collagen amino acids because collagen tends to be less gluconeogenic than other amino acids. So you're going to spit up uh, more sugar from proteins that are going to be higher in methionine and higher in muscle meats. Collagenic proteins tend to be a little less gluconeogenic. All right, we got some questions coming in here on Facebook. Let's rock them out. Okay, got it. One patient comes in here, one person comes in here. I have a D fragilis showing on my PCR testing. Can that cause elevated levels of free cortisol? And would you treat the parasite or candida first? So typically off the bat, yes, infections can create inflammation in the gut. And it's the silent inflammation. Because if you have an infection under the hood, it's, you know, my, the analogy that I use, it's like allowing a guest to come into your house. You have a guest bathroom and bedroom that you never go into. They leave the water on, right? You get the water bill this next month and it's like sky high. And you're like, what the heck? I didn't, and then you go into the room and you see the water's on and you're like, oh shoot, I didn't realize it. But even though you didn't know that water was on, it was still stealing resources from your water bill, right? Your water bill was double or triple this last month. Same kind of thing with your body. There's internal cortisol, there's an internal anti-inflammation that's happening to help put out that fire. There also may be additional stress because unlike the water bill, in your gut, you're absorbing nutrition. So if you have inflammation and leaky gut, you're going to create more immune stimulation, undigested food particles, LPS. Uh, fungus, candida, acid aldehyde, that stuff getting into your bloodstream, that's going to create a lot more stress as well. Not just, it's even worse than the analogy that I gave you with the bill because um, you're absorbing nutrition and you got you got your immune system interaction that's going on there too. Let's keep on going down the list here. See if I got some more. Is it all right to have more pain during the H. pylori killing before feeling better? So again, when you're dealing with the H. pylori killing, Typically, the herbs that I use in my line, one's called GI Clear 2, which has some healing and soothing nutrients in there like DGL, aloe, slippery elm, et cetera. So those things are going to be healing and soothing. So typically, my patients, I, I recommend using more of the GI Restore, which are like healing L-glutamine, um, healing amino acids. I try to push that more, more bone broth. If the gut's more inflamed, there's kind of like a gastritis going on, more bone broths, more liquid foods, everything's peeled or mash, no added uncooked fiber, lots of soups, ginger tea, really keep it healing and soothing. Think about your gut as like you got a big sunburn on your back. Even though you love to have a massage, that massage may hurt your back because of the sunburn. So think of that gastritis, so that inflammation and that gastric mucosa is like a sunburn on your back. So you just got to be really gentle, a lot more healing and soothing nutrients. And in my line, I would ease more into the GI Clear 2 first. And I'd literally start with one capsule at a time and gently increase as long as there's no inflammation and pain. And take the herbs with food because in that product, there's still going to be some clove, some wild indigo, and obviously mastica and some berberines, which are antimicrobial. So just take it really slow and ease into it. Hope that helps. All right. Do you have recommendations on the on the technicalities to look into a daily multivitamin? Great. 
I'm going to take my multivitamin right now as we chat. A uh, couple things. You should be looking for activated B vitamins. So P5P, which is like uh, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. That's activated B6. You want to make sure there's not any folic acid. In my line, I use LMTHF folate, which is a, a patented version of quatrifolate, which has activated folate, no folic acid. A good percent of the population can't activate that, and it can actually create stress on the body. MTHFR, people, you know, 30% of people have that MTHFR um, heterozygous. I should say you have a 30% reduction in converting folic acid to folate when you have heterozygous. That's one SNP of either the C677 or the A1298C. So you have a 30% reduction if you have one SNP. If you have homozygous, that means you have two of them. You have a 70% reduction. So you really want to avoid the folic acid which is synthetic, and you want to do the activated folate. Uh, good fish oil, but that can be taken separate. So activated B vitamins, I would say minerals that are chelated and bound to amino acids that allows for better absorption. So for instance, in my line, we use malic acid or glycinate. These are Krebs cycle intermediaries or amino acids just allow for better absorption. Cheaper multivitamins will have like magnesium oxide, which may be better if you're just if your goal is to help with like kind of laxative effects, getting the bowels to move, but not the best if you're trying to increase magnesium levels. And I would say after that, um, what are some other really good things? So the chelated minerals, the activated B vitamins. I would say um, mixed tocopherols, like a combination of a vitamin E, not just the alpha tocopherol or the DL alpha tocopherol, which is the synthetic form. You want a combination of mixed tocopherols. And I would say uh, avoiding, like when they say vitamin A, you don't want just the beta carotene. You want like the 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 palmitic acid or the, the retinal palmitate. Typically, I think my line, we get it from palm trees. That way it's activated vitamin A. It's better than the beta carotene, which has to be converted. And there's some studies in that that, that can cr increase lung cancer if you do too much of that. So, and then uh, selenium is great. Selenomethionine is a better amino acid for selenium to increase that. That's some good starters there, I think. Uh, what's the best way to clear high reverse T3? So, number one, get your adrenals dialed in first. That's number one. Number two, improve selenium levels. 200 micrograms of selenium will pop down that reverse T3. Uh, also, adding in liver support can be helpful, milk thistle can help clear reverse T3. And then of course, just do things to help support your liver by not adding stress, right? Pesticides, chemicals, glyphosate, Roundup, drinking really clean water, all that stuff's gonna be helpful. Eating organic, again, we can go into the, the really cool protocol stuff, but work with the foundational stuff first. So when gone through niche pyloric cleanse, is it okay to use herbs while fasting? I know you mentioned to take the herbs before a meal. Um, is it okay to take on an empty stomach? Yes and no. If your gut's really sensitive, like this patient earlier said that had a gastritis issue, then it may inflame that gut lining. The less inflamed that gut lining is, the more you can tolerate it. The reason why I've updated my instructions to say take five minutes for food, because I'd have about 20 or 30% of patients that would take it on an empty stomach and they would complain of irritation and upset and nausea afterwards. And again, food tends to fix that. So by doing it five minutes before you get it in there, it gets through the gut into the intestines without being diluted by food. But you have the food coming in in a few minutes later that will take away any potential gastritis or nauseousness. So yeah, if you can tolerate it, totally on an empty stomach between meals is good. If you have issues, you know why and you know how to fix it. Hope that helps. Okay, my insulin level is 32.9. That's ridiculously high. Yeah, ideally you should be around four or five. So yeah, normal range is two to 19. I would say under, I'd say between two and five is great. Doctor never mentioned this. Should I be concerned or do something to lower this? Heck yeah, you should be very concerned. That's incredible insulin resistance going on. I would maybe just one serving of berries per day for your carbohydrates. Um, and then all the other carbs should be non-starchy sources. So if you have a plate, right, if your plate, Maybe one handful or one sliver would be a handful of berries and everything else should be non-starchy vegetables while you're eating good healthy meats and good healthy fats. But that's significant insulin resistance. I'd be surprised if you're not knocking on the fence of diabetes um, right there. Uh, what's your take on chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome in regards to what causes it? So chronic prostatitis, again, 
the foundational things will always cause it. Insulin resistance, right? Um, omega-6 to omega-3 skew in fatty acids. So you're eating more refined vegetable oils and junk than the healthy saturated fats, healthy fish, healthy coconut, healthy avocado. So get the fatty acids straight. Get the insulin level in check. Uh, that means getting the carbohydrates dialed in according to what your needs, more non-starchy veg than starchy veg and fruit. And then if you want to dive in deeper, you can look at the inflammation in the gut from infections. Also, cadmium and some heavy metals have been associated with prostate inflammation. So that can also be looked at too. But that's just kind of the low-hanging fruit. We can dive in deeper. Um, you know, men having higher estrogen levels can definitely cause problems too. So I would look there first. And then, of course, some nutrients that can help, pumpkin seed, selenium, a lycopene, saw palmetto, you know, zinc, natural 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, like I just mentioned, uh, that will help significantly. Okay, Dr. J, my fish oil has soy lecithin in it. Is it okay to stay away from soy altogether? Yeah, soy lecithin isn't that big of a deal. It's There's no protein component in it. Soy lecithin is primarily used as an emulsifier to help break down the fatty acids. That's totally fine. Again, in my line, we try to not use the lecithins. I, in my fish oil, Omega-3 Supreme, I use a lipase. So I actually put a fat enzyme in there, lipase, to help break that down. But yeah, I don't have a problem with it. Most good companies are going to be using soy lecithin that's GMO-free, so not a big deal. But again, if you're really autoimmune, it may be, but for most people, it's probably okay. Okay, I was told I have high testosterone. I'm a female, high estrogen, and low progesterone. Okay, that's a common pattern right there of estrogen dominance. High testosterone, I'm thinking polycystic ovarian syndrome. I'm thinking insulin resistance as well. Again, it's the same person that mentioned 32.9 insulin levels, so that makes sense. It's probably PCOS. Doctor told me to move the location of where I apply the progesterone. Is that doing enough? Well, number one, I'm guessing that you're using a cream. That makes the most sense to me. If you're ch talking about changing the location, maybe you're rubbing it on your knees or maybe it's intravaginal. I would do a sublingual progesterone. Uh, I would look at getting the adrenals looked at, and I would be 100% focused on getting my diet and blood sugar right. That's going to help so many things. One of the biggest stressors on the, on the hormonal system is blood sugar. So if your blood sugar is either swinging up and down or it's just chronically high and you have insulin resistance, that's going to be a big concern. James says, I've been taking 60 to 80 grams of collagen protein with incredible results for joint and bone regeneration. Love it. Is there a level of collagen that is too much? that will cause damage. I mean, personally, I just think you just put collagen, you make it a part of kind of your daily regimen. 60 to 80 is on the higher side, but if you have a lot of like DJD or gut inflammation or you have a lot of joint stuff, your body's gonna need it. But I would just take a look at what your daily requirements for protein are. So typically, I like half your body weight in ounces or half your body weight in grams. So I'm 210 pounds, right, 60 to 10. So I try to do at least uh, at least 110, 120 grams of protein a day. Now, I may go up to three quarters gram per pound of body weight. So that would look like if I'm 200, to keep it simple, that'd be like 150 grams of protein. And if you're actively lifting and you're an athlete, you go for a one-to-one, -one, 200 pounds, 200 grams. And like some of my professional athletes, I mean, they'd be up maybe 1.5 to one. Like Charles Pollockin talks about even being two to one for some of his NFL guys, like if you're like a linebacker or a lineman, you need probably double the amount of protein per pound of body weight. And also people that are bigger, like if you're already overweight, you're probably going to need more because there's more strain on your body to begin with. So you never want to give your body less and expect it to do more. So you actually want to give it more while your metabolism is resetting. So I think just take a look at what your daily requirement for amino acids are and just try to make sure it fits within that. And you may be you may need three quarters gram per pound of body weight. So if you're 100 pounds, 75 grams, 200 pounds, 150, you may be even at one to one. But again, I think if you make it fit within that three quarters of a gram to uh, one pound of body weight, right, I think you'll be okay. All right, so do you recommend genetic testing for gluten sensitivity? Um, I only do genetic testing for gluten sensitivity if people are not cutting it out. Uh, gluten, let's say you weren't gluten sensitive. Gluten is not a good food. It's high in other gut irritating compounds like, 
lectins like phytates, oxalate, oxalates, a lot of mineral blockers and protein and mineral disruptors. So not good anyway. It's not really high in nutrition. If you look at it from a nutrient density standpoint, check out Matt Lalonde's lecture. I think it was at Ancestral Health Symposium in 2012. He broke that down well. It's just not really nutrient dense. It's inflammatory. You tend to skew that omega-6 to omega-3 balance there. But yeah, if someone's giving me a hard time, we'll run that HLA DQ, t DQ test. I think it's DQ2 and 8 are the celiac genes, and then 1 and 3 and alpha-1, beta-1 are got more gluten sensitivity genes for sure. Um, menopause and IF. Again, I did a video on this just yesterday for female hormones. It's kind of the same because women that go into menopause that are healthy – right? They tend to go into menopause healthy because they were a healthy cycling female. So if you go into menopause with a lot of symptoms, you tend to have had probably symptoms while you were cycling as well. That tends to happen because when you go into menopause, you don't have that hormonal output from the ovaries like you did when you were cycling. The FSH and the LH, like I talked about in that video, will actually just start to go high because the, the communication of that feedback loops being disrupted. And your body will run more on the DHEA sulfate from the adrenal gland. So if your adrenals are tapped because of blood sugar issues and inflammation and just you know poor physical, chemical, and emotional stress, a lot of the symptoms of menopause creep in. That's going to be like thinner skin, vaginal dryness, low libido, mood issues, brain fog, of course, hot flashes, depression, anxiety. So you, you really want to work on the same things that a cycling female would work on. Again, the difference is when we apply specific hormone therapies, we wouldn't do it during certain phases of the cycle. We kind of be able to do it flatline because there's no um, cycle happening. Menopausal females are actually easier to treat than cycling females because they start to turn into men regarding what their hormones look like. Their hormones are more flatter and consistent where a cycling females up in the follicular phase with estrogen and then up in the luteal phase with progesterone and then dropping. So it's the cycling women there a little bit harder, but the menopausal females, they have the issues typically because they came into menopause with issues from being a cycling female as well. Hope that helps. Started taking 2000 IUs of vitamin D3 and my hair began to fall out. Could this be a symptom of a nutritional deficiency or other issue? That's a great question. It's either number one, really poor vitamin D, or it was something else that was happening in and around that time frame. Really hard to say, but I'd pull it out if the hair comes back. Uh, I would add it back in, see if it falls out again, and then I'd probably switch brands and see if something was in it that could have caused a problem. Also, a menopausal female who lifts heavy twice per week. My goal is to lose three dress sizes. Protein intake, I mentioned that before. I'd say at least half a gram of protein per pound of body weight. 100-pound female, 50 pounds. 200-pound female, 100 pounds or 100, uh, 100 grams. So half. So whatever the amount of pounds you are, cut that in half and make that grams. 200 pounds, 100 grams. 150, 75 grams, 100 pounds, 50 grams of protein. Had Hashi's, so off kilter cycles. Yep, again, thyroid issues and female hormone issues are interchangeable, especially if you have an autoimmune thing going on there. There's probably a gut thing. There's probably a blood sugar thing. So you really want to get the immune system and the gut dialed in and then support the adrenals and the females and female hormones. And make sure the thyroid's good too. Thyroid interplays. Um, profoundly. Again, progesterone is a really important stimulator of TPO, thyroid peroxidase, and that helps make thyroid hormone. All right, let's keep on rocking it here. Let's see here. Already addressed the T3 issue. Good smoothie for the gut. Again, good smoothie. I'm a big fan of just collagen peptides, juice some green vegetables. I do kale, cucumber, celery, spinach, a little bit of lime, a little bit of lime in there. If you want to sweeten it up a little bit, half a green apple or one carrot, and then maybe some add some MCT oil in there to, to help make it a little bit more satiating. Awesome. Hey, Steve. DHEA, awesome. Good job with that. Perfect. Yep. Vitamin D, fat-soluble vitamin taken with fat is always helpful. Can you have all the symptoms of low estrogen without the hot flashes? Um, depends. We're talking a menopausal female. Some of the hot flashes happen because FSH, which is a brain hormone, starts going high, which creates vasodilation. So potentially, uh, menopausal female, yeah, that, that can definitely happen. It tends to be from the FSH and a combination of the estrogen dropping. All right, let's keep on addressing everything so far. Let me see here. 
Dr. J going to have some Tito's tonight, made it from non-GMO GMO corn syrup. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Again, you should do it the way I do it, which is going to be Dr. J's Moscow Mule. Get some ginger kombucha, half a lime squeezed, um, and that's going to be phenomenal. If you want to sweeten it up, one or two drops of stevia, and you are good to go. That's the best way to do it. Is serum iron level an accurate, reliable marker for iron deficiency or overload? No. It's good to run it. Like when I run an iron panel, I have serum iron. I have ferritin. Ferritin is storage iron. Serum iron is kind of what's in the bloodstream. So it's kind of like the gas tank reader, that's ferritin. That's the, that's the storage form of gasoline. Think of iron serum as the gasoline that's actually in the carburetor getting ready to be combusted. Okay, TIBC and UIBC are binding proteins that are inverse. So they go high when iron's low, they go low when iron's high. And then you have iron saturation. Think of iron saturation as how much oil or how much gasoline's in the carburetor in each cylinder, right? The more, fu more full the cylinder is, iron saturation uh, goes up. And I think that pretty much hits it. Iron saturation, TIBC, UIBC, that's the binding receptors. Iron serum, that's what's in the carburetor. Iron saturation is how filled that carburetor is or that cylinder is. Yep, that pretty much sums it up. So not the most accurate. And again, you always have to look at inflammation. If inflammation is really high, iron can artificially go up. So you got to keep that in mind. I had a continual high serum B12 for years. I don't know why my body isn't clearing it from the blood. Any thoughts? I would just look at your multivitamin or your B vitamins and see if you're taking a lot of it. If you're taking a lot of it, you may just want to drop that out. Again, anything over a thousand or so is probably high in the B12. But if it's from a multivitamin thing, then I would just um cut that down and you'll be okay. What's the difference between free form amino acids and branch chain amino acids? So free form amino acids are just what they are. They're a combination of amino acids that could be methionine, glycine, glutamine, leucine, where branch chain amino acids are going to be leucine, isoleucine, and valine. There's three of them. And those amino acids are special because <clears throat> they can literally go right into the muscle and be burnt up for fuel. So there's a lot of catabolic sparing effects that you get with branch chain amino acids because a lot of the other proteins, they have to go to the liver first. They have to go through a process known as gluconeogenesis where they're converted to glucose and then they can be used for fuel where branch chain aminos can go right to the muscle and they can be stripped and utilized for fuel right away. So it's kind of like fast-acting fuel for the muscle and can really help spare catabolism. I'm going to shift over to Facebook here. All right, let's see what I'm missing. Okay, H. pylori issues. Yep, those are all die-off issues. Just follow the die-off reaction protocol, like I mentioned. Taper in the herbs slower, more gut healing and soothing nutrients. You ever seen a patient who has bright red, very hot ears? This happens anytime I get hot or upset. Nobody seems to have any idea. Well, more than likely just the fight or flight response that's happening there, right? The sympathetic nervous system drives blood to the extremities and to the surface of the skin. Uh, why? Because fight and flee via arms and running creates sweat, which makes it hard for someone to grab you if you're fighting or fleeing. So that's part of the sympathetic nervous system response. Also, excessive redness, get rosacea is actually autoimmune too. So there could be some autoimmune stuff driving it clean out the diet and get the adrenals and the sympathetic nervous system under control will be a great next step. I'm just stating that the journey to understanding my hypothyroidism, been on Synthroid for five years, and I still have all my symptoms, hair loss. Okay, I can't read all the comments here. Let me see. Let's see what I got. Okay, so if you still have the hair loss, the issue is there's specific enzymes that need to that need to be there to convert thyroid hormones, specifically the D2 and the D3 enzymes. And these enzymes aren't present when you're given Synthroid. So a lot of people, they can't finish that conversion of thyroid hormone, right? TSH, T4, a lot of these D2 and D3 enzymes help with T4 to T3, T4 to reverse T3, and then also T4 to D2 uh, to T2 as well, which is a metabolically active compound that's not even tested and measured. So number one, fixing the adrenals is really important because that cortisol can have an effect on that T4 going to reverse T3. And then also getting a full spectrum of thyroid glandular that has T3 in it, also T2 in it, T1, actually T0, and even calcitonin and protomorphogenic compounds. So 
get a good thyroid support, make sure the adrenals are working. And then if you have thyroid issues, there may be some liver and gut stuff. So make sure you're working with a functional med doc that can actually look at the whole system and not just be myopically focused on the thyroid, which is good, but connect it with the other systems as well. Hope that helps there. Uh, what's better? Kefir or yogurt. Um, kefir is great. It's just, you know, going to be cultured. It's going to be a higher amount of probiotics in there. Um, again, yogurt's going to be, have less probiotics in it. But if it's like a kind of a, a Greek or like a Bulgarian, like sour yogurt, and you know that you aren't dairy sensitive and you can handle some lactose, you'll probably be okay. The benefit with yogurt is a lot of the probiotics in there can can um, eat a lot of that lactose up. So then you have less of it, but there's still maybe some casein that may make you more sensitive. So just keep that in mind. All right, back to YouTube questions here. Can you get a good idea of thyroid performance from measured levels of TSH, T3, and T4 performed at LabCorp? Yep, yeah, I'm just assuming is T3 free or total? Is T4 free or total? The free is a little bit better because you can look more at what's available, what hormones they are to bind to the receptor site. So Free fraction hormones represent about two to five percent of the hormones made by that gland. The other 95 to 98 percent are protein bound. So when you're looking at total, it's looking at the whole package. When you're looking at free, you're looking at that two to five percent that can bind to a receptor site. So the free is the most functional. So you can get a window into what's actually there and able to be bound to a receptor site. Hope that helps there. Do you recommend using mastica gum to eradicate H. pylori? If so, how much and how long? Uh, in my line, I use GI Clear 2 for that, and there's a combination of mastica in there, and we'll use that for at least 60 days. But you know, a lot of times I'll even use mastica by itself, typically two grams per day for at least 60 days. Do your female patients with severe hormone imbalances need to keep taking bioidentical hormones even after the GI killing? or do they send them to an endo for prescription of thyroid hormone? That depends. So if we're talking about thyroid issues, a lot of thyroid issues are autoimmune in nature. So if the immune system has attacked the thyroid so much where the follicular reserve of thyroid hormone in the follicles is very low, and you may need to be on it longer, if we can, if we can stop the damage and there's still function of those follicles and synthesizing hormone, then we may be able to get you off it. We always try and see how, what your body can make. Regarding adrenals, adrenal treatments will last six months to a year. It depends. If you're menopausal, you may need to be on some level of hormone longer term just because your ovaries aren't popping up the amount of progesterone and estrogen they used to, and you're having symptoms like hair loss, like skin stuff, like mood, libido, vaginal dryness, and you may just want to combat that because you don't want to have that downward decline. You know, Mother Nature is kind of cruel in that area. Once you reproduce and you pass on your, your offspring, uh, it doesn't really care about you after that, but we know that there's still life to live and we want to make sure that quality is as high as possible. So utilizing some hormones in that area, the smallest possible dose to replace what's missing is ideal, but the scenarios depend. Females that are cycling, we try to utilize it as a jump start and then be able to pull you off. If there's autoimmune thyroid stuff, it may have to be long-term, worst case scenario, but we always try to get you off. All right, good. Beyond impressed with your knowledge. Thanks for answering the questions. You're totally welcome. Thank you. Any good foods or supplements to enhance nitric oxide for male performance? Yeah, arginine is going to be great. Um, if you're doing any green juice, you can uh, juice uh, a bead or two in there. That's going to be great before a workout to, to help uh, improve um, NO2 levels and increase vasodilation. Should you eliminate coffee and or clean alcohol or wine when treating H. pylori? Again, coffee, again, H. pylori is known to create gastritis or gut irritation. So if coffee is irritating your gut, then you should pull it out. A lot of people take coffee. If they do it with good healthy fats, right, and proteins that may make the coffee easier to process. There's some coffees that are less acidic that are mixed with medicinal mushrooms, organoderma that may be less irritating. So it totally depends on your situation and kind of where you're at. Gut irritation, I would try pulling it out and then try some of the more softer, gentler options with fat in there to help make it kind of more time released. And same thing with alcohol too. Again, I'm a big fan of like Prosecco's or kind of like dry champagnes. Uh, I'm a big fan of the, the Chandon Prosecco. Absolutely love that. Just gets me just the nice gentlest buzz with zero hangover, and I just feel so good while on it, and there's just zero coming off. I don't feel any letdown. So like one to two glasses on a nice you know, Friday or Saturday night, and that's it. 
for the week for the most part. What are you eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner today? So I actually gave my dog, I put my put it on Instagram, I gave my dog the same lunch that I had. I had some nice pasture-fed bacon and some pasture-fed eggs, and now I'm just sipping on a little bit of Bulletproof coffee, and then I have my good filtered water over here with a whole bunch of minerals in it that I'll sip in between. And then lunch, I have leftovers from yesterday, which was a nice can of skipjack tuna, which has the highest selenium and lowest mercury ratio. I have some gherkin pickles. I cut up some kale and put it in there. Mark's Primal Mayo and uh, an avocado. So that's a really good high fat, good protein, you know, lots of good veggies in there for my lunch today. Hope that helps. Are you able to run test to diagnose histamine intolerance? I mean, you can run histamine load. That's totally possible. Um, regarding that, I would just recommend doing a lower histamine diet and see if some of your symptoms get better. If the symptoms get better going lower histamine, like you feel better cutting out fermented foods, you feel better cutting out cheeses, wines, you feel better cutting out citrus fruits, you feel better cutting out like D DAO blockers like teas and coffees, then there may be a histamine issue. And then you can add some of the higher histamine foods back in if you have a problem. And if you're worse, then you probably know it's a histamine issue. Go back here to Facebook. Is it all right to eat carbs with an H. pylori infection or make sure it's worse by giving it sugar? Again, I, I assume that the carbs you're talking about aren't non-starchy vegetables. Non-starchy veg should be the foundation, and then everything else can be dialed in accordingly. If you have a lot of gut issues, you may have some fructose malabsorption. You may have to eat fruit away from the meal because of the enzymes there, or just do the smallest amount, do the largest amount that you can handle without having any symptoms. Maybe just one or two servings a day. Got to figure that out and see what works best. Becky, you are totally welcome. Thank you for that feedback. Let's see, is it common to have high blood pressure and hypothyroidism? I'm only 36 years old and I've been on meds for both five years. I feel like my body. Okay, so off the bat, if you have high blood pressure, always look at inflammation, always look at insulin, right? Those will drive problems. Insulin will cause, obviously insulin's high because of glucose and glucose will cause more sodium and sodium will cause more water retention and water retention will increase blood pressure. So get that component dialed in. Make sure magnesium and potassium is dialed in. 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day. Um, you can always tell them an extra on magnesium, natural calm or some magnesium malate or glycinate at night's totally fine. Make sure those minerals are dialed in. Vitamin D is great. Blood sugar is great. A healthy proteins and fat, get the insulin under control. That's a really good first start. And then worst case, you can use some natural herbs um, to help that as well, like celery roots, great. Um, there's a couple other herbs that are really good for blood pressure, but typically the minerals are going to be excellent. Um, Hawthorne's going to be great. Magnesium's going to be great. Magnesium's a natural beta blocker. Vitamin D is going to be great. That's a good place to start. But get the in inflammation, get the insulin dialed in. That's going to be a huge, huge help. There's a lot of blood pressure herbal formulas that are out there too. Herb Farm makes a really good blood pressure formula. I'd start with that. And also get the sympathetic nervous system under control. The sympathetic nervous system will create vasoconstriction, which will increase blood pressure. So getting the adrenals and the sympathetic nervous system dampened while you increase the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest, should be really helpful. Are you pretty sure that all coconut oil and ghee at extra good quality fat isn't going to kill me in the end? Heart disease, stroke, so difficult to wrap my mind around the higher concept. Yeah, totally. I mean, a lot of the studies, like the one on coconut oil, the older studies back, you know, in the 70s and 80s, which some of that that research was pulling from the older studies, they never differentiated saturated fat and trans fat. And once you pull out saturated fat, healthy fats like coconut oil, palm oil, grass-fed meat, butter, when you pull them out from a lot of the trans fats and the refined vegetable oils and you separate them, um, there's not a problem, right? These are the confounding variables. So when you look at a lot of the epidemiological studies on like meat being bad, well, they're survey studies. So someone says, yeah, I had meat today and meat could be like a conventional hot dog with bun and ketchup or it could be like the pepperoni and sausage on my pizza, right? Well, this isn't the kind of meat we're talking about, right? Not to mention that meat's all eaten with a whole bunch of flour and processed sugar and crappy carbs. So again, once you fret out that kind of meat from like a healthy pasture-fed, you know, pork sausage or some grass-fed meat or some good wild-caught, you know, Alaskan sockeye salmon, 
two different things are happening there. Number one, the meat's better. You don't have the hormones and the crap and the antibiotics. But number two, you don't have the refined sugar that's being coated on that crap as well. So you got to pull out the confounding variables and there isn't an issue. Coconut oil, take a look at Bruce Fife's book on the coconut miracle. Very good information there. Let's see here. Well, GI killing, how many carbs do you recommend? 100 net carbs. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to push the carbs up during killing to help bait out, kind of chum the water so you can see the sharks if you're going to go shark diving. You're chumming the waters for the bacteria so you can knock it all out. All right, I think I answered all the questions. I'm already late for my next patient. I'm going to go dive in and start helping some more people today. Anyone has any questions, feel free and check out justinhealth.com and reach out and make sure you subscribe and share these, this information so more people can get help. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care.